All right, this series Grace, uh, the subject of grace in the book of Romans. This is lesson number four in that series. Title of this lesson, The Response of Grace, uh, part one. And we're looking at uh, Romans chapter three, verses 21 to 25. Well, you have to admit that uh, so far in our study uh, of Romans, uh, things have been pretty depressing. If, if we had to stop right here, it'd be a pretty depressing uh, study. You know, Paul is building his case for the universal need of mankind for Christ on the basis of the universal guilt. You know, everyone's guilty of sin, everyone is condemned. You know, it's pretty, he starts off with the, it's kind of a good news, bad news type thing. He starts with the very bad news. No matter who you are, Jew or Greek, you're a sinner and you're condemned. So all we've talked about is sin and death and judgment for everyone, for the Jew, for the Gentile. And Paul has explained so far, if we just review the salient points here, first of all that, um, that uh, God has expressed His grace initially by creating the world and placing human beings at the head of it. God's you know, first expression of grace, that's what it is. And then mankind, beginning with Adam, has rejected this grace by disobeying God's command. This disobedience has uh, clouded man's nature and has sent him uh, rushing headlong into a cycle of what we said, a, a kind of a cycle or a falling cycle, beginning with a theological fall, a philosophical, and then a moral fall or failure that would ultimately cause mankind to self-destruct. If it weren't for God's intervention from time to time throughout human history, you know, all those interventions, you know, the flood and the choosing of Abraham and, and so on and so the, you know, If God let the thing go, man would just, you know, the intention of his heart was continually evil. What do you think happens when the intention of people's hearts is continually evil? Well, eventually they self-destruct. They kill each other. But Paul explains that even though mankind is lost, unable to save itself, God has devised a plan that will enable all to be safe. So there you know, we're turning the corner into the good news. And be saved not only from the vicious cycle of failure in the everyday life of every human being, but also save from the judgment and the punishment that all men will face after they die. So you know, the, the glimmer of the good news begins to appear. Uh, chapter three and four. You see, one day the cycle of our lives will end and we will die and we will lie and wait until the larger cycle of mankind's end uh, will be finished with the return of Jesus. And at this point I explained, and I'm not going to go back over this, but I did say that at the end when Jesus comes, all will be judged. Those who died without faith in God and those who died with faith in God and those who are alive when Jesus comes, all of these people will find their final end when Jesus returns. And so we, as far as the book of Romans is concerned, we move into the last part of chapter three of Romans. And now we see Paul begin the next section of his letter and that is God's response of grace. So you had you know, man's response, disobedience, and God's response to man's response. And God's response is another show of grace. So God begins by offering grace to mankind by creating the world and putting him at the head of it, and man responds with sinful obedience. So how does God respond to this? Well, he comes right back with a second offer of grace. His first offer is one where he creates the world and puts man in it. His second offer is one where he recreates mankind and takes him out of the fallen world in order to put him into the spiritual world. So that's his second offer of grace. Now what's interesting here is that both of these offers of grace center on mankind and both of them are made possible by Jesus Christ. Let me explain why. In 1 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, Paul writes, for by Him all things, and this is Christ, 
for by Him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. Again, he's talking about Jesus Christ here. And he says that the world was originally created by Jesus and for Jesus. In Romans, Paul is going to explain that the recreation of mankind will also be made possible by Christ as well. So the image is complete in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. Paul writes there, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope, meaning the non-believers and the, you know, the, the mockers, so on and so forth. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, meaning those who have died faithfully and who are waiting for the return of Christ. Those are the ones who are falling asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen, um, those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Notice everyone's up in the air with the Lord. There's no, there's no thousand years going on here on earth and a second you know, millennium happening. You know, when Jesus returns, the dead in Christ, the living in Christ are gathered together in the air and so we shall always be with the Lord. When the Lord comes, that's it, it's the end. The end of the world, the end of Satan, the end of death, the end of the disobedient ones, the, the end of evil, the end of sin, it's the end of everything. There's no second act. So he says, therefore comfort one another with these words. Then in 2 Peter, Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to His promise, we are looking for a new heaven, excuse me, looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And so that's pretty clear. A couple of different passages that talk about the same thing. What happens when Jesus returns? Well, Peter here is focusing on the, the physical universe will be you know, burned up, be destroyed, replaced by a new spiritual universe that he uh, refers to as a new heaven and a new earth. So, so here the writers explain that at the end of the world it will again be Jesus Christ who will transform the saved from dead believers and dead bodies to glorious believers, glorious bodies, and transform the present physical universe into a completely spiritual kingdom for us to dwell forever. And the point I'm making with all of this is the first offer of grace, the creation of the world and man at the head of it, that was done through Christ. And then the second offer of grace, that's going to, the recreation of man as a spiritual being living eternally with God, that second offer of grace is also mediated by Christ. Okay? So the grace of God working through Christ to transform us from nothingness to life at the beginning and then from lost to saved during that cycle of destruction, and then from dead to eternal life at the end of the world, all of it powered by Jesus Christ. That's you know, when they say He is first and last, that's what they're talking about. He is involved in everything, the original creation, the recreation of man into spiritual being, the transformation of man into a glorious body, all of it powered by Jesus Christ. Okay. So before we look at God's renewed offer of grace, I want to examine more closely the effects of sin on individuals from a more personal perspective. Remember I said 
Paul many times he talks about the effect of sin but on a, like a macrocosmic, you know, the world and history. So I want us now to focus in on just a person at a time. How does that cycle affect people and how do they respond uh, to God and how do they respond uh, to the law telling them that they are uh, in sin. So we've looked at the overview in the historical cycle of mankind falling from grace. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we now want to look at sin and how it affects our relationship with God, but at a closer range. I suppose the question to ask in this regard is, why is sin so damaging to us? Because God forbids things, actions, thoughts. He forbids sin because sin is destructive to us. He doesn't forbid sin because he doesn't want us to have any fun or pleasure or freedom. He forbids sin because he knows that sin has a destructive power over us and he loves us. Just like we discipline our children. They're too young sometimes to understand the consequences of what they're thinking of doing or what they're doing and you have to say no. And, but you can't explain why no. Because sometimes they're just too young. Well, let's take a look. Why is sin so d damaging to us? Whoops. Damaging because sin destroys our intimacy with God. Intimacy with God is the substance of spiritual and eternal life. It's what the experience of eternal life is. It's intimacy with God. Uh, in John chapter 17 verse 3 Jesus says, and this is eternal life. Okay, he's going to tell you, what, what is eternal life? It's not just length of time, it's an experience. So he says, and this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So the, the essence of eternal life is that we have an experience, an intimate relationship with God. So a broken fellowship or a broken relationship with God doesn't just mean that I don't go to church anymore. It means that our ability to see and to perceive the other side where God is, um, our ability to perceive the spiritual dimension or the other reality or the kingdom, no matter how you want to describe it, sin seriously disables or destroys that ability within us. For example, the sin of adultery. The sin of adultery in a marriage blinds you from seeing your partner in the way that you did before. Why? Because the adultery gets in the way. You know, I've counseled people who've gone through that. One partner you know, cheated on the other partner. And you know, sometimes you see this dialogue in the movie. One, the, the person, the victim you know, who was cheated on, they look at it the, and they say, I don't even know you anymore. Who are you? Here I was thinking you were this person and now I find out that whatever, you had an affair. Who are you? Well, they're expressing this very idea here. The intimacy between them, they knew each other or they thought they knew each other. That thing got broken. Why? Because of the sin of adultery. Well, in the same way, you know, we're looking at God and saying, who are you? Where are you? Why? Because our sin has gotten in the way of us you know, having a relationship with Him. That's why every sin is dangerous because each contributes to the lowering of our spiritual vision. Every bad habit we excuse in ourselves is like a growing cataract that limits our ability to perceive God clearly. Unrepented sin brings us to the point where we can only see this world and the scary part is that we don't even realize that this is our condition. You know the old story about the lobster you know, being boiled or the frog being boiled you know, slowly. That's us. That's us with sin. When this happens we see preachers as meddlers and we resent others who try to point out our weaknesses and our lack of vision. You know, it's like the elderly who get cranky if we suggest they should you know, get better glasses or hey how about a hearing aid what'd you say yeah how about a hearing aid you know we that's us everybody else is aware of the problem except us so spiritual blindness leading to death 
is one thing that is caused by sin. One of the most dangerous things. And I mean, you know, the more we don't see God, the more we can't you know, get into the relationship with Him, the less we want to do things with Him. So we don't feel like worshiping Him. We don't even know who He is anymore. We don't feel like serving Him. We don't feel like sacrificing for Him. We don't feel like denying ourselves other things because, well, we just don't have that relationship. Another thing sin does, it, destroy, it, it deprives us rather of true freedom. You know, living in ignorance of sin frees us in a way from the demands of the law and conscience. You know, if I don't know something is a sin, well, I don't know it. I just keep doing it and I don't know that's a sin. But living in sin, ignorant of Christ or in rejection of Christ, doesn't mean we live in absolute freedom. Freedom from Christ because of ignorance or rejection means that we live in slavery to whatever passion or fear that is the strongest within us, which could be lust or greed or survival or fame or power or security, whatever. This is the same for the movie star who lives for fame, the homemaker who lives for the next remodeling project, the person who lives for the next moment that his or her addictions will be satisfied. And addictions, you know, we're always thinking about drug or alcohol, but you know, caffeine, nicotine, sex, illicit drugs, pornography, plenty of addiction, shopping, spending. We are all slaves. The question is, who or what are we enslaved to? We can't always tell from the outward appearances, except when it gets chronic, because everybody is so busy creating a front to hide their sins, but all of us, all of us struggle with our own allegiances. So those who are not totally aligned, enslaved to Christ, are subject to enslavement to something or someone else, and in the end, it'll be revealed. No secrets, right? Numbers 32, 23 says, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure that your sin will be found out. Always a big scandal when you, know, you find out some famous or powerful person or politician or whatever, someone in the public eye, you find out that, oh, you know, just name it. You know, the, they consume pornography or they abuse children, or whatever. You know, we find out their sin and we're like, oh, wow, that's terrible. And so on. Can you imagine having all your sins, your ugly, dumb things revealed before God? He knows them already, but before God. The beautiful thing about Christianity is that the Lord forgets our sins. He remembers them no more, it says. I mean, just for that alone, just to save myself that experience, <laughs> I'm going to stay faithful to Christ. I don't want none of my junk you know, exposed. I'm glad he forgot about it. The, only, the, the trick now is if I can forget about it, but better he forgets about it. So man's Reactions, some of the things that uh, the, the result of sins. Let's talk a little bit about man's reactions when confronted with their own sins. How do we react? All of us are like this to uh, you know, one degree or another. Denial, of course. People say this, whatever sin it is, is not a sin. You know, they get angry, or they reject that opinion. No such thing as sin. We have an entire philosophy now that rejects that idea, relativism. You know, it depends on your point of view. It's sin for you. If it's not sin for me, it's not sin for me. That's it. I choose that this is not sin for me. And so therefore it's not sin. That's the, you know, that's the society we live in today. Um, rationalization. Everybody does it. Or I'm not so bad. Or this is not a big sin. Or God wouldn't really condemn me, would he? Or it's my only pleasure. I remember a brother who died in Canada. Paul knows him as well. Uh, heavy smoker, heavy, heavy smoker. And you know, openly, you know, package of cigarettes be in his pocket you know, at church. You know, just, he stank of tobacco, wouldn't quit, nothing. Finally died of, of course, lung cancer. And his point was, it's my only pleasure. <laughs> it's my only pleasure. 
God, I give you all these other things. I come to church, I do this, but this is, this is my only pleasure. And he's not the only one that said that to me about that particular thing. It's my only, it's the only thing that relaxes me. You know, it's my only pleasure. Well, that's just rationalization. Or just this once, or once, one last time, all realization strategies. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, human nature moves towards self-justification. Human nature moves towards self-justification. Why? Because we're sinners and that's what sin does. And rationalization is the vehicle that carries the person there to self-justification. Another common reaction when confronted by sin, procrastination. I'll deal with this problem, this sin, when, all right, just fill in the blanks, uh, when I'm older, uh, when I'm stronger, uh, when I'm wiser, uh, tomorrow, after the new year, uh, at, the, at the retreat, yeah, it'll be a good time to do that, at the retreat. Procrastination gives us the feeling that we have done something because we've made a decision. I got a good feeling, I made a decision. The decision I made was, well, I'll do it later. <laughs> the decision, however, to do it later never impacts our lives because that's all we ever do. We make a decision about it, but we never do anything else about it. Procrastination. One more, delusion. Pretending to be perfect already. Thinking that their sins are so small that God doesn't even consider them since they never committed adultery or murder. You know, I'm okay, I'm good. People who are blind to their selfishness or gluttony or greed or lack of business ethics which damn them as much as adultery and murder. You know, if you're unethical and you rob your clients you're just as subject to condemnation as the adulterer or the murderer. You're a thief. And then, of course, selling out, giving up, diving in, knowing that it's wrong and not caring, just fully enjoying the pleasures and the short-term advantages of evil in this world with no regard for tomorrow. What did David the psalmist say? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So these are you know, signals that one is losing their spiritual vision or has none to begin with. And so sin works to lessen one's spiritual vision to the point where we cannot perceive the things of God and see and become attached to the things of the world which have no power to transfer us into the spiritual dimension. All the money in the world can't get you to heaven, can't get you to the other side, can't transform you. All these things merely give you something here. And so what does God do? He sends Jesus a historical and spiritual lightning bolt that everyone can see. No excuses, no excuses. So as we get back to our text, we'll see how Paul explains what God has done through Christ, motivated by grace, to solve the problem of universal sin and its consequences, and the consequences, of course, of sin, separation from God and slavery to sin. And by the way, that word you know, to die in the Bible means to separate. It doesn't mean you know, heart attack and pain and things like that. Well, in a sense it does. But in a larger sense, the word to die meant to be separated, our soul separated from our body. The second death is our soul separated from God. We can't avoid the first death, but we can avoid the second one. That's what we're talking about. So Paul is now going to explain how a condemned sinner, not even looking for God, can be transformed into a saint, saved for an eternal life in an intimate relationship with God. Now, the 10 lines contained in verses 21 to 25 of chapter 3 hold the core idea of the gospel or the good news or the solution to man's universal problem 
with sin and death. Very important uh, several verses. Chapter 321, we're going to read those. Begins, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Now it helps us to understand this complicated passage if we understand some of the key words in advance. That way when we reread re it, you know, it makes a little more sense. So let's look at some of the key words, shall we? First of all, the word law. Well, when Paul writes the word law, he talks about the, the revelation to Moses, the official title of the Old Testament that includes the prophets and the Ten Commandments. But the term law also refers to the principle of law or the idea of some kind of standard by which something can be judged. Okay. The word righteousness in verse 21 is the quality or the state of being, uh, the state of being just, or the state of being sound or without prejudice or guilt of any kind. The word faith in verse 22 can mean two things, either the belief and the trust that something is true or someone is legitimate or a body, or it can mean a body of religious teaching. It depends on the article. If it says the faith, it's talking about doctrine, the faith, the body of religious teaching of Christianity. If it just says by faith we're saved, well then it's talking about uh, believing that something is true and trusting an individual. All right? The term glory in verse 23, of course, means to praise or to acknowledge something. The term justified in verse 24. Uh, the term justifies the means or the method by which one becomes righteous. You become righteous through the process of justification. Um, someone who is justified is someone who is considered innocent. Someone who is considered sound or just. Now one can be justified because one is proven to actually be innocent and thus just or righteous or one can be justified because the crimes that one commits are forgiven him. We, Christians, become justified not because you know, we have no sin, we become justified because our sins are forgiven. And that's why it's so important to acknowledge sin, you know, to be aware of it in our, in our lives. The term grace, a gift, or an attitude of benevolence or compassion or generosity. The gift or the grace that God gives us is embodied in His gracious attitude towards our sins, that He sends Jesus, that He makes a second offer of grace, and so on and so forth. The term redemption in verse 24 means to purchase something back or to free something or to liberate or to redeem. I go to the dry cleaners, I bring my suit, they give me a ticket with a price, you know, $10 to be dry clean. Well, I don't have my suit anymore, but I've got the ticket. In a couple of days I go back, I redeem, my, I give them the ticket and the $10 and I redeem. I buy back, I get back my, my suit. A pawn shop, right? Isn't that what happens at a pawn shop? You bring a, an old clock or something, you get a pawn ticket and then you go back and you, you redeem it, you, you buy it back. Now I would never do that to the old clock that I have, but that's a, that's a family secret. And then uh, propitiation in verse 25, not a word that we use a lot, right? We use the word redeem and grace, but propitiation, not something that you know, is in our everyday vocabulary. Basically, it means an appeasement. It means a peace offering. Um, you, know, you have a nasty, you have an argument with your wife, uh, and you're really at fault, you said some harsh things, you know, what, for whatever reason, and then on the way home, you stop at the flower shop, you buy a beautiful bouquet of flower and, uh, flowers, and you bring a, a peace offering to smooth over a, a conflict that you've had 
with her as a way of saying, I apologize, I, I bring this as a, a peace. The flowers are the propitiation, okay? Peace offering. Important to note, however, that in the Bible, it is never man that offers to God an offering or an appeasement in order to be reconciled. That is in pagan religions. In pagan religions, people, human beings, offer something to the gods in order to appease them so they won't be angry with them anymore. The worst example of this in the Old Testament the, um, the Canaanites and others offered their children to Molech. They would burn them alive, right? Why? Well, it was an appeasement. And why the children? They were the most precious things. It wasn't silver or gold, it was your own child. You would offer your child as an appeasement to the gods, okay? That's paganism. In Christianity, it is always God who provides the peace offering or the appeasement or the propitiation himself in order to reconcile man back to himself. It's as if the wife purchased the flowers and gave them to the husband so that he could give them back to her as, a, as, an, as an appeasement. So Christianity is very different in that, in that sense. And why? Well, because we don't have anything that you know, we can give to God. He's the one that gives us something to offer back to Him. Now, in the Old Testament, this word propitiation referred to the mercy seat or the cover that was placed over the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies, that part of the, that inner sanctum part of the temple. Uh, the Holy of Holies, the inner chamber where the high priest was only allowed to enter in once per year to offer sacrifice. The ark was placed in this room. At the beginning, it formerly contained the tablets of the commandments and Aaron's rod and a jar of manna, but by the time of the temple, it only had the, um, the tablets of the law in it. This ark, or this box if you wish, had a cover over it that was decorated with two angels whose wings touched. Each year the high priest would enter and sprinkle the blood of a sacrificed animal over the cover uh, as a way to cover and thus cleanse the sins of the people. The priests represented the people and they would lay hands on a sacrificial animal and symbolically transfer the guilt of the people. You know, the, the people were transferred onto the priests. The priests would lay hands on the animals, transfer the guilt of the people onto the animal. Then the animal would be killed and its blood offered as a way of cleansing the people of sin. They would sprinkle the, the mercy seat. That's how they would you know, offer the animal uh, to God. Since life was, you know, life is in the blood, right? Genesis 9, 4. Since life was in the blood, the animal's life or blood was given to God by sprinkling it on the mercy seat as an appeasement, as a propitiation, as a peace offering. Now the mercy seat covered the tablets of the law and the law condemned the people for their sins. So you see the symbolism there? The law was there always condemning the people. The blood was sprinkled over the tablets, over the, over the mercy seat, a symbolic way of saying a, a, a propitiation was offered uh, to cover the sins that the law condemned in the people. So when the blood was sprinkled over the mercy seat, it provided the peace offering necessary to cover the demands of the law for sins. That was in the Old Testament. So when Paul mentions the word propitiation, it conjures up the entire process of offering up sacrifice and the role of the mercy seat and the idea of a peace offering as a method of dealing with sin between ourselves and God. So he mentions this first to remind his readers, this, is, you know, this was the preview of how God would deal with sins. A life would be offered to cover, the, the, you know, to pay for, if you wish, the, the cost, the moral price of the sins of men. And for hundreds of years, the Jews repeated this process and the ceremony uh, in order to keep alive and to keep in mind the method by which God would ultimately deal with sins. 
Now it's a key word because it summarizes the method that God chooses to deal with us in regards to our sinfulness and our separation from Him. Okay, so now that we've got some of the words lined up, we're going to stop right here. Next week we're going to start the text itself, now that we understand the words and then we're, we're kind of move through. So I don't usually give homework, but I would suggest that you just read Romans chapter three, just read it, you know, the chapter. Read it a couple of times this week. It'll make a lot of difference when you're sitting here and you've got the, the, the chapter in mind and I'm going through it ex explaining it. The heart and soul, the core of the gospel message is right here in chapter three. Okay, well that's our uh, lesson for today. Thank you very much for your attention.